Part 1 You will hear a woman calling an accommodation agency about properties to rent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. Easy let. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. I saw your advertisement in the paper and I'm calling to ask about renting a flat. Certainly. What kind of flat had you in mind? Well, um... I don't know exactly. I mean, it depends on price to some extent. OK. Now, we have properties across the whole range. The average is probably £120 a week. Oh, I was hoping for something a little cheaper. They start at £90, that's the lowest we have usually, and they go up to £200. I could manage the lowest figure. An important question is how long you're thinking of staying in the property. We don't do short lets. I'd want a flat for nine months, perhaps longer. That would be fine. Our contracts are for a standard six months, and that can be extended. Fine. I'd need to come in and see you? Yes. Our office is open from 9am to 5pm. I'd need to come in on Saturday. OK, then we're here between 10am and 4pm. We also open on Sunday mornings until 1pm. Saturday is fine. If possible, I'd like to see details of some properties first. We can post you a list, or you may find it easier to look on the internet. Oh, yes. I have the address here. Thank you. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. What else would you like to know? I wonder what I might need to buy for a flat. What's included in the rent? That depends on the flat to a certain extent, although some things are standard in all flats. For example, every flat has kitchen equipment provided for your use. Good. Does that also mean tableware, cups, glasses, plates? In some flats, but not all. OK. And bathroom towels, sheets and so on? I don't think any flats have those included. I can easily buy some. I don't suppose flats come with a TV? In fact, they all do, although they may not be the most modern models. Oh, that's fine. But it's different with the telephone. That's up to you to organise. These days, most people seem just to use their mobile phone. I can imagine. What extra charges would I get? Is heating extra? Yes, it is. But the water bill is part of the rent, so you don't have to pay for that. Right. I've noted all that. Are you looking to move into a flat soon? I hope so, yes. The thing is, we have a few flats at the moment that we'd like to get rented out by the end of the month. I see. They're all good flats, and at the price you want. There's one in Eastern Towers, one in Granby Mansions, and another in Busby Garden. All three are nice blocks of flats. Could you tell me where they are? I'm at the train station at the moment. Eastern Towers, if you're coming from the station, isn't very far. Cross over City Bridge, then go left, and where the road divides, you want the right-hand fork. You'll see Eastern Towers on the left side of the road. It's a lovely building with trees around it. That sounds nice. What about Granby Mansions? And the best way to get there from the station is probably to go down River Road and then cross over Old Bridge. The road bends to the right round the park, and if you follow along, you'll find it there on the left side. That's a great location with lovely views of the park. 
Very nice. And you said there was one more? Busby Garden, yes. OK, from the station, cross over City Bridge. Keep going through the first crossroads until you come to the second crossroads. Busby Garden will be facing you over to the right side. It's very convenient for the shops. Fine, thank you. Well, I'll see you on Saturday. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a Director of Student Administration from Mitchford University giving a talk on Open Day. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello to you all. Thank you for coming to Mitchford University's Open Day. My name is Jackie Alford and I'm the Director of Student Administration. I must begin by passing on some late-breaking news. For the second year running, Mitchford University has been the winner of the prestigious Distance Education Award. As an online university, we are thrilled with this and thank our excellent staff for their dedicated work. We now add this trophy to our Research Excellence Award. The only one remaining is the best overall university, which we are expecting to be announced in the near future. Now, I want to cover a few aspects of what we offer our students from the student administration point of view. I would like to cover a few of the core things we deal with here at the university. Our office is always busy. Firstly, we handle all requests for on and off campus housing. First year bachelor's degree students, we offer any and all assistance. If you're considering a postgraduate degree with us, which some of you uh, coming to the area with families are, I've met some of you already, I think. Please be aware that due to staff constraints, we are only able to help international students. My department is also responsible for the collection of all student fees and, aside from exam week, we often assist with timetabling. Our department is in close contact with enrollment, so we know all your examination results. Student fees are used to help with the extracurricular activities here on campus. Each semester, we put on a movie night and last year we tried a music appreciation night which was well received. We often invite a number of local charities in the area to participate in our movie nights. This has been a good way for us to give back to some of the local people. Now when you apply for a place at Mitchford University, your application package goes first to the registrar's office where it is either accepted or rejected based upon your past academic record and test results. If you are accepted, it comes to the Student Administration Department, where we examine any special requests you may have included in your application. After that, a letter is sent to you informing you of your acceptance. The whole process takes about three to four weeks. 
Generally, if we receive applications by April or early May, students are notified of their acceptance in late June unless you make mistakes with your application, which is all too common. Before listening to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. Yes, there are things we ask you not to do. Some people forget important information, believe it or not, and we get this most often. Some applicants forget to include a forwarding address. We can't send anything back to them. Another big one is forgetting to include past academic records. Hey, please don't forget them. We've had minor problems with people forgetting to include the processing fee, which stands at $45. Still others leave off the compulsory picture of themselves. Oh, yes, and perhaps the most common mistake people make is sending the application to the incorrect address. Please send the application to our post office box address. Okay, that's enough for me. Any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two university students discussing their course and a project they are doing together. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Martin. Hi, Kate. How are you? Fine. I'm relieved to have done my presentation. I'm sure. How did it go? Oh, OK in the end, but I was ever so nervous beforehand. It's silly because I do know my stuff quite well. I must know those statistics inside out. But when you have to get each table of results to come up in the right order, it can make you nervous. Mm. It was my first time using the computerised projector, and I was sure I was going to get the controls wrong or something. And, of course, that's not a good situation if you know you've got to listen to questions carefully and be ready to answer quickly. But it was fine once you got going? Yes. I do feel that the standard of presentations could be improved in general. I think a lot of the lecturers agree with me, although I don't honestly know what they can be expected to do about it. Students need to appreciate the difference between style and content. Too many presentations are just a mass of detailed content, all very worthy, without any attempt to engage people's interest. Basic things like looking at your audience's faces seem to get forgotten. And that makes it harder to concentrate on the points made about the research itself. Yes, there are quite a few improvements I'd like to see. Take tutorials, for example. I feel they're often a missed opportunity. I come out not feeling sure about what I've learnt. Week in, week out, I faithfully plough through the reading list, which is fair enough, but then the discussion doesn't seem to extract the main issues. It's frustrating. Mm, I know what you mean. Mind you, we have to take some responsibility ourselves. 
I actually got quite a lot from that skills workshop I went to on taking notes, and I'd like to make similar improvements in the next semester. Hmm. The reading list we get has several websites each time, and I want to learn to navigate my way round them more effectively. Now that sounds a good idea. Mind you, it means spending more time in the library. If you can get in. You mean because it's too crowded? It isn't big enough, is it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I like to work late in the evening, and it shuts before I want to finish. But I know you can access the catalogue from a laptop. Which personally I haven't got. Actually, the problem for me is that I like to get up early and start work straight away, and they don't start until nine. I wish they'd change that. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Look. We ought to start working out what to do next for our project. <laughs> yes, enough moaning. <laughs> okay, the main thing is to allocate the various tasks between us, isn't it? Yes. Well, we're going to need the questionnaire before we can do much else, aren't we? Do you want to handle that? I'd assumed we'd do it together. Well, you have more experience than me. Maybe you could think up the main questions. You know, a first version of the whole thing, and then I could read it through. And make suggestions. Well, okay. My experience on projects has all been with closed groups. I don't really know how you go about selecting subjects from larger populations. Actually, it's it's quite straightforward. You use tables of randomised numbers. Could you show me? Yeah, I'll take you through the process. That way, you'll learn, and I'll feel surer for having someone else there.、Uh, now that brings us to the interviews themselves. Right. Would you like to do them, or are there too many? Well, your typing's pretty fast, isn't it? So if you agree to handle the transcribing afterwards, I'm prepared to do the face-to-face -face stage. Does that sound fair? It does to me. But tell me if you find it takes longer than you thought. And vice versa. And when we get the results all together, they'll need to be run through statistics programs, won't they? Now, that's where I always feel a bit unsure about which tests are the correct ones to choose. Same here, but we can get advice from the lecturers about that. Shall we do all that as a joint effort? I think it'd make us feel more secure about what we were doing. Yes, it would be terrible to get that wrong after all the hard work leading up to it. And then we've got to present the whole thing to the group. Will you feel up to doing that? I think we should do a joint presentation. It's all both our work, after all.、Mm, I guess you're right, but would you mind getting the slides and so on ready? I find that takes me ages and still doesn't look any good. Whereas I quite enjoy that kind of thing. Okay, now we need to think about a few. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a talk by a university lecturer about the Aboriginal language of Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We'll begin our course of study this semester by looking at the role of the English language among the native or indigenous peoples of Australia. Aboriginal English, as it is often referred to, was described by one linguist as the first and most significant dialect of Australian English. Over the years there has been much research in the continent of Australia concerning the use and types of Aboriginal English. Some linguists have suggested that there were literally hundreds of languages spoken by the indigenous or Aboriginal people. European settlers who came to the continent of Australia brought with them their own language and this was adopted by the Aboriginal people. As a result, many of the languages used by the Aboriginals died off. I should mention that in Central Australia, white settlement began comparatively late with the setting up of the Overland Telegraph Station near Alice Springs in the 1860s. For the Aboriginal people of Central Australia, the coming of the white man to the area had a negative impact upon their culture and language. However, despite their domination, a number of Central Aboriginal language groups managed to survive quite well. Today, the two main language groups in the area are Waropiri and Ararenti, also known as Arunta. These dialects are spoken only in remote areas of the continent. These areas include the Kimberleys, Arnhem Land, Far North Queensland and Central Australia. The two major language groups, Waropiri and Ararenti, are both estimated to have well over 3,000 fluent speakers. Another Aboriginal dialect, known as the Western Desert Language, is spoken by a large group of some 5,000 speakers extending over a 25,000 square kilometre area of Central Australia. So just how many languages were in use by these people? It's difficult to say conclusively, but some linguists have suggested as many as 260 while others quote a more conservative figure of around 200. Regardless of the actual number, there have been many forms of communication among the Aboriginal people, a people who comprise approximately 2% of the current 20 million strong Australian population. It's interesting to note that many Australians refer to Aboriginal languages as dialects, thinking that they are all dialects of one all-embracing Aboriginal language. This is actually incorrect. In fact, all of the original estimated 250 languages were mutually incomprehensible, as different from each other as, for example, German and French. Aboriginal society does, however, provide frequent examples of bilingualism, with some people speaking several languages and dialects. In actual fact, a number of the languages spoken by indigenous Australians are themselves actually variations of English. A number of these languages have a great deal in common with English, but have their own distinctive words and meanings, as well as accents and grammar. The Aboriginal people view their language as a way to maintain their unique identity within Australian culture. Of those languages studied, about 20 are still being used today. However, as the older generations die off and are replaced by the younger, even these 20 are in danger of being lost. The others, they've all but been destroyed. They remain unused, but live in the memories of the elderly. In some cases, they are trying to be revived by indigenous communities. In order to do so, the youth must learn to take a greater interest in their cultural heritage, or knowledge of these languages will go to the graves with those who knew them. If we don't act now to preserve these languages, an element of history will be lost forever. That is the end of part four.
You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.